Good morning, Anna. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad you're here. Wonderful time to worship our amazing God. It's an awesome day. Beautiful sunshine. <laughs> Chance to get out and about. And I am glad that you're here with us today. Yeah, we are light up here on the platform. But again, it's just lovely to uh, hear you and uh, have you worship with us and be part of the team. It's a great thing. You want to make sure you get a program so you can follow along today. You know, uh, Pete always has good things for us in there and uh, God's word especially so we can take that and meditate on our hearts this week. Um, lots of things happening. Again, uh, checking in with our groups. I know this Wednesday is Cancer Support Group. Tomorrow night we have a special event at uh, Ministry Monday. Derek Frazier from uh, Frontline Foundations is coming um, to talk about uh, drug abuse um, and addiction treatments here in Porter County and their ministry and how it's changing lives. Again, great opportunity to uh, be part of something, but also um, to be praying for them in their ministry. Um, there also is an, uh, a flyer inside your program about Not a Fan. Pete will be talking about this a little bit more, but you want to make sure that you grab a hold of this and hang on to it. Um, several things to help us get prepared for the new series and uh, to be looking forward and praying for um, the blessing that's going to be in our lives. Uh, you guys know, make yourself comfortable, get yourself some coffee, and we're going to continue to worship at this time.
Katie's going to share a scripture with you right now that um, I think is um, kind of the essence of where um, I really uh, sense our worship is this morning and what God has kind of uh, been working on me uh, over the, this last week. So, uh, Katie, this is out of Psalm 36. If you guys have your Bibles with you electronically or otherwise and you want to kind of read along. Where are you going to start at, Katie? Verse 5. Um, Katie needs a microphone. That would be good. Yeah. Okay, try that again. What Verse 5. There we go. <laughs> That's better. Uh, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are, ge are deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied in the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Song that we've sung before that David, as he wrote this psalm, was... Uh, coming out of a time of, of testing and trial and pursuit and uh, still even through all of that he was saying this in his psalm your love oh
Well, we're um, going to go ahead and uh, finish up with this particular song that... Uh, I would like to encourage you to imagine life differently this morning. I want you to uh, 
imagine that you are still away from the cold and the snow (laughs) and that you are following Jesus You've traveled 2,000 years into the history. You are in a halfway around the world, and you are in a place where it's nice and warm. And as you are watching him, you are trying to learn how to best empower one more to walk together with God. You're learning from the master, the best of the best, the one who started a movement that has reached billions and billions of people over the course of the last 2,000 years. And as you watch him, you've learned a lot of things. You've noticed that uh, he walks perfectly with the Heavenly Father so that there is nothing for people to say against him. And his holiness is a key component of his effectiveness in reaching out to others. But you've also noticed that it's not just the holiness, that there is something different about him. When he walks into a room, it's not like the rest of the the teachers of the day, where they either are insecure with their teaching or they're looking down their noses at people. But Jesus seems to have this knack of being able to to see somebody and look them right in the eye, right where they are, meet them right there, and then challenge them, empowering them to grow. As you watch him, You recognize that there are other pieces about his effectiveness and you just kind of uh, try to pay attention to what he does and how he interacts with different people. You start to see that, that people are made differently and so the ones that he draws around them are all different personality types and styles and, and approaches. They're, they're not trained people that are, um, you know, Pharisees or Sadducees or uh, they're not even teachers of the law. He, he seems to draw people around him that are just kind of normal, ordinary people, fishermen, uh, tax collectors, which really aren't the best of the best. And he works with them so that they will become his team. Last week we talked about Uh, different giftedness, but today we're going to focus on the team that Jesus built before he took off. I want you to imagine watching Jesus' life from start to finish, just looking through the lens of how he built his team. We refer to his team oftentimes as the apostles, but if you pay attention, there's more than just those 12 who are a part of his team. And as you start to watch, you're going to notice some patterns that show up over and over again as he's working with people to build his team. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting out nets into the lake, and they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, I'm not going to say the current NIV. I'm just going to say it the way we sing it. At once they left their nets and they followed him. The first thing you're going to notice, and I'm going to bring this back up again next week, is that Jesus went around simply inviting people to follow him. He invited, really, everyone. Everywhere he went, he was inviting people. Now, they responded differently But his invitation was open to everyone and anyone who wanted to follow. And he did it looking them in the eye. He did it in a personal way. And speaking of being personal and looking people in the eye, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. What I'm going to invite you to do is to go and say hello to somebody. Tell them that you're really glad that they decided to come here today and to worship God with you. Go ahead and do that right now. As Jesus starts to build his team, I think uh, maybe one of the misconceptions at least I had as as I would read scripture uh, years ago, I always kind of thought that when he called, for example, Peter and Andrew like he did here, 
And he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And it says immediately they left their nets and they went and they followed him. I kind of assumed, I don't know why I had this picture, but I kind of assumed that when he did that, he was asking them to be a part of his 12. But in recent years, as I was reading through again, and this is one of the benefits of reading through Scripture multiple times, the more you read it, the more things start to pop out and you notice something that you didn't notice last time that you read through it. So I don't know when it was. It was just a couple of years ago. It wasn't all that long ago. And I was reading through it, and it hit me that when he went and said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, and they dropped their nets and they came and they followed him, he was not inviting them to be a part of the twelve. He was not inviting them to be one of his inner circle. He was not inviting them to be on his his close-knit team, at least not yet. He was inviting them and saying, hey, if you come follow me, this is where I'm going to take you. And it's the same invitation that he gave to a whole bunch of people. What we don't have here is the list of people that he invited to come follow him so that he would make them fishers of men. And they said, ah, I'm a little busy right now. You know, and I got a lot of stuff going on. Maybe next week. Come on back and check with me then. You know, you know work is just slamming me right now. We don't have really all of those listed here. What we do have are the ones that responded positively. But what I want you to see is what I noticed just a couple of years ago. And that is that there was this secondary process that Jesus went through that had to do with the group of people that had responded yes to his original invitation. When Jesus first invited Peter and Andrew and James and John and, and uh, Bartholomew and anyway, all of, the, all of the guys that came and hung out with him, he ended up with a, a group of disciples that was far more than 12. And we see that later on in him sending out 72, but we also see that in the way it's talking about these kind of mini crowds of people that were starting to follow him around. The groups that were following him were getting bigger and bigger. It was somewhere in this process, one of those days, that Jesus went up onto a mountaintop to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called all of his disciples to him, and then he chose out of that group 12, whom he also designated as apostles. See, he invited everyone, and then when he saw how they responded, when he saw how faithful they were at coming and hanging out with him, when they saw how they were asking questions and listening to him, he watched them, he learned from them, he paid attention to them just as Jesus did so well. And then he went and he talked to the Father about them and said, well, what do you think about Joe? Well, what do you think about, you know, Frank? What do, you, what do you think about Simon and Andrew? And he prayed that through all night long. Then he came back and he selected. See, he invited everyone and then he selected 12 out of that everyone. We don't talk about him having an interviewing process, but somehow we don't know a lot about it. We would have seen it if we were there to watch him, but there was some sort of an interviewing process that was going on. And the interviewing process wasn't about come in and tell me how you would respond in this situation. It was much more how did they actually respond to these situations. He invited them to come hang out. He didn't offer them money, power, positions. He just offered to teach them how to fish for men. And then he watched them. He prayed and he selected. So the second thing that you'll see is that he selects people. He selects people for positions. He selects people to do jobs. He selects people as he goes along here 
probably based upon skills and giftedness. We don't really know. We don't have a lot about his selection process. We do know that it's bathed in prayer. We do know that he only selects out of the people that are already hanging out with him. If you want to be chosen by God to do something, then probably the best thing to do is to hang out with him. If you want to be selected by God for a ministry, my guess is the best thing that you could do is stay close to him. So that when he's looking around, he goes, Oh, you, yeah, you're here all the time. Can you help me with this? And then you will be on his team selected as well. Now the people that he selected, he started to take through a process. Take a look at this. When Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming toward him. He saw, and he said to Philip, is one of the 12. Now, where are we going to be, buy bread for these people to eat? Now, I brought this scripture up a couple of weeks ago, but now I'm going to take it a little bit further for you. He says, where are we going to get bread for these people to eat? Now, he asked this only to test him, for Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Have you ever had anybody do that that was training you or teaching you? It's actually a pretty nice process. You, you get involved in the process. They're asking you questions. You start having to try to think through how to resolve or fix this issue that is facing you right there. And he gets to find out, the, the teacher gets to find out where you're coming from. He asks a question, and by asking a question, he's finding out where you are in your process. He knows where he needs to get you, what you're defining when you say, well, maybe we could do this, or how about this, or, or you answer his question in one way or another. He knows your starting point then. It's an excellent, excellent teaching methodology. He asks him, he knows what's going to happen here. It gets Philip thinking about it, and he goes, well, <laughs> it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. That's not going to work. We don't got any money. Uh, Andrew's there. You ever have the kid in the class that always is just wanting to, ready with the answer, right? Andrew was there, Peter's brother. He jumps in. He says, well, um, there's a boy here. He has some, some five small barley loaves and two small fish. That's not going to get us very far, is it? I, I, I imagine Jesus as kind of a conversational teacher. He, he'll, walk, he'll walk down the road with, with his team, and he'll say, what do you guys think about this? And they'll get a conversation going, bouncing ideas off of each other. Jesus doesn't knock down bad ideas. He doesn't knock down good ideas. He gets conversation going. Now, he does eventually point them right where they need to go, especially if they start to get off track. But if they come to the conclusion themselves, he says, well done. Good job. Exactly. He involves them in the process. And as he does it, Andrew jumps in and says, well, we got a little bit of food here. And then Jesus says, well... Okay, have the people sit down. They do. They have them sit down in groups. You know the rest of the story, right? The five loaves and the two fishes. Jesus prays over it, blesses it. He says, now distribute that to the people. I have to wonder what the 12 were thinking at the time that he said, distribute that to the people. Yeah, great idea, Andrew. Now we've got to take this food and everybody's going to be complaining because there's not enough to eat. Way to go, man. wonder if there's those kinds of conversations going on take and distribute to the people five loaves, two fishes. Somebody in the 12, I'm sure, did the math. Somebody in the 12 said, okay, all right, now you got two fish. There are 12 of us. Somebody, we need to slice this into six slices of fish per fish, and that will get us 12 pieces to take. And then uh, each one of you can cut that into smaller pieces and start taking them around to groups. I'm sure somebody in the group was doing that. That, that, that's somebody with the gift of administration, okay? 
Five loaves. Oh, wait a minute. Five goes into 12. Oh, that's not going to work. Man, th- that math is just really bad. Okay, let's... Uh, uh, and then somebody else says, I'll just take a chunk. Right? That's somebody with completely different giftedness. Jesus wants us to go talk to them. That's what this is about. Help them feel at home. Maybe they have the gift of encouragement or hospitality. I kind of like to wonder what the conversation was that day before. However they did it, they broke up the fishes, they broke up the loaves, and they went around and they started giving food out. And then they looked back in their basket. I don't know how he did it, but they looked back in their basket and there was more food there. Maybe as they started to do it, they started to hearken back to Elijah and the widow. And every time she went back to find oil and flour, it was there in the midst of a drought. And every time she went back, it was, you know, this is going to be our last meal and then we're, gonna, we're not going to have anything to eat. We're going to die. And then she'd go back and there was more in there the next day because the prophet Elijah had performed that miracle. I wonder at what point as they were taking the baskets and giving out food and then went and looked at the basket, at what point each of the 12 went, oh, the chill just went up their spine. We're in the midst of something great here. Who is this guy? I thought he was just going to teach me to be fishers of men. Whenever the moment was, they continued to do their job. They went around and they they took care of feeding thousands and thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. When everybody had enough to eat, not everybody had a bite, not everybody got to nibble on a small cube that was diced up by the person with the gift of administration to just the right size so that it will feed everybody and we all get one bite when they had enough to eat. They were all fully satisfied. People who wanted seconds went back for seconds. Then he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Don't let anything be wasted now. And they went and they gathered and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces. Why 12 baskets? Because there were 12 of them. By this point, the 12 had been selected. They were his team. They were his go-to guys. He had them do jobs because as you do ministry, you learn things. As you do ministry, you draw closer to God. As you do ministry, you experience the power of God. It's not until you are in the midst of a, an unsolvable problem that it just is towering over you and ready to overwhelm you. It is not until you are in the midst of that kind of a storm and God comes in with the solution that you so couldn't see coming. It's not until that moment that you let go of control. Because you see, it's when they had to take a little piece of bread and a tiny hunk of fish and start to go out to give it to people that they had to be afraid. They had to be worried. They had to be thinking, this isn't going to work. I don't know what he's talking about. But, you know, he chose me as one of his 12. He says, jump, I'm going to jump, but it <laughs> I know it's not going to happen. I'm not going to say anything, though, because it's Jesus, you know. <laughs> Have you ever been overwhelmed by something? Have you ever felt out of control? Have you ever been so totally immersed in the problem that you can't even begin to fathom a solution? I remember one time, it was very early in my walk, the financial problems that we were facing at the time. We had, uh, we had 
we were going to sell our house. We bought another house. The first house did not sell. And so we're getting ready to carry two mortgages. Our first child is on her way. We didn't know it was a her at the time, but she was on her way. And so now we're going to have the added expense of a child. Tracy and I set our budget based upon both of our incomes. We were both pretty well paid, uh, coming fresh at, for, for college kids, fresh out of college in the computer industry. And Tracy got laid off. I remember feeling like the, the waves were just crashing over the top of me. I remember being so angry at God. I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to do what you've asked me to do. How? Ugh. Do you not get this, God? Are you not seeing what's going on here? Why aren't you helping me? Yeah, I actually said those things. Probably a little louder than I just did right there. I actually... I actually was screaming at the top of my lungs as I was in the car driving because I didn't want anybody else to hear me and I didn't know any other way to do that. Tears started coming down. I pounded that steering wheel, that poor steering wheel. It never did anything to me except for steer the car. I pounded that steering wheel. It was in the midst of that storm that I first saw God at work. It was in the midst of that storm that I turned on the radio and somebody was on there talking about handling finances God's way. Are you kidding me? And then, of course, she had to buy this book or the set of books. And I was like, yeah, sure, more money that I don't have. For whatever reason, I bought the set of books. For whatever reason, I started to read it. For whatever reason, I was ready to grasp at any straws possible. And you know what? It was then that I started to actually put God's Word into practice in that area of my life. And for the first time, I really trusted God. It took work. It was mental battles and all, all the way through the process as I was going through it. But you know what? When I applied his principles, when I listened to his word, when I did what he said, guess what? It all worked out. And I never saw it coming. There was no way I, with my mathematics degree, my computer science degree, with all of my intelligence and wisdom, there was no way I could figure out a solution. But he already had the solution right there waiting for me, if I would just listen. We learn a lot more when somebody shows us rather than tells us. And Jesus would show his disciples over and over and over again the power of God at work. And that only happens when they get immersed into that relationship with him, walking with him, hanging out with him, doing ministry with him. It was only in those contexts that they could see the power of God just showing up all over the place. He didn't just show them. He took it further. He would explain it to him. The disciples came to him and said, Why are you speaking to the people in parables? And he said, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, not to them. And then he would go and he would explain the parable. A good teacher. And as someone who loves to teach, I, I love to, to read about Jesus' teaching. And so he did teach with words. He did explain things. He explained things to the 12 that he did not explain to the 72. He explained things to the 72 that he did not explain to the crowds. Jesus taught. But I'll tell you, uh, uh, and, and he would uh, ask as well. From time to time, the disciples would turn and no longer follow him. And he turned to the 12 and he said, do you want to leave too? 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. When Jesus would ask questions, as I said before, oftentimes he already knew the answers. But when we verbalize the answer, we realize where we are in our process as well. We recognize, yes, I really do believe this. We recognize, yes, you really are the Lord of my life. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two, and he gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for your journey except, except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money for your belts. Wear sandals, but... Uh, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you, under, uh, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you, listen to you, then leave that place, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And they went out, they preached that people should repent, they drove out demons, they anointed many sick people with oil, and they healed them. The twelve learned an awful lot. When Jesus thought they were ready, he sent them out. He, he sent them on test runs to try, to practice, to do. They, just, they didn't just sit around, you know, and crack heads of wheat and eat those and, and uh, you know, talk about parables all day long. They did stuff. And as they did stuff, they learned and they grew. In the beginning, it was simple things like take bread and go ahead and distribute it to everybody, pick up the leftovers. As time went on, he was saying things like, go and preach what I have taught you. Go and tell people to repent of their sins. He would go out there and say, go and cast out demons. Cast out demons? If somebody came to me and said, you know, Pete, go and preach that people need to repent and go cast out demons, I'd be going, what? Jesus didn't send them until he had already taught them. They were ready for this. And so he started to send them out on test runs. He did it with more than 12. He did it with the 72. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town to place where he was about to go. And so they were sent. As you start figuring out what Jesus is doing to empower someone to empower one more, it is a very involved process. It is not something that you can get by uh, book or tape. It is not something you can get by just watching from the sidelines. It is something that you have to actively be involved in. If you want to be a part of his team, you need to actively engage with him. Because that's how he did it with all of the people he worked with when he was here in human form. If you want to be a part of his team by uh, giving gifts or offerings, now is the time to do that. You can go ahead and take the connect card that you filled out, fold that up and put it in the offering bag as it comes around, participate in, in the worship in that way, especially if you put a prayer request on there. Take that request and turn it over to him and say, okay, uh, I'm going to look for your answer here, God. I'm trusting you with this. I need your leading, your direction. I want to be on your team. Let's go ahead and give our gifts at this time. Rise and follow me. I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Rise and follow me, I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Peter, John, and James could never be the same. After they heard him say, I'll make you fishers of men. He said, Rise and follow me, I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He said, Rise and follow me, I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me, I'll make you 
make you fishers of men. Cast your nets aside and join the battle tide. He will be your guide to make you fishers of men. He said, rise and follow me. I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He said, rise and follow me. I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus bore the cross. Together in the lost, oh, what a mighty cause to set us free from sin. He said, rise and follow me, I'll make you worthy. Rise and follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He said, rise and follow me. I'll make you worthy, rise and follow me, I'll make you fishers of me. Maybe you're like me in this. I, uh, I had to learn how to participate in teams with people. I grew up in a household where um, doing well yourself was always rewarded. And if you could do better than the guy next to you, then that means you won. It was a race, or it was a competition. We, we breed that in, in America. An, an individualistic, I can do it, I don't need anybody kind of an attitude. But that was not at all what Jesus bred in his disciples. He told them that if you want to be first, you need to be last and servant of all. He told them regularly, consistently to work together, to get along with one another. Much of his teaching had to do with things that you can't do on your own because you can't have forgiveness unless you have someone to forgive. You can't show love unless there is someone to whom you would show the love. Jesus built a team. And he regularly, consistently had them interacting with each other, working together. And even when he sent them out, he didn't send them out by themselves, did he? He sent them out how? Two by two. A mini team. It's really hard to let go of that individualism. It takes humility. It takes compassion and love. It takes a willingness to start to trust someone else and to be willing to forgive them when they fall short. Jesus was all about teams. When he... Uh, the, the day of uh, unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed, Jesus sent out the team, uh, Peter and John, and he said, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Uh, and they said, well, where do you want us to go to prepare for it? And he said, well, go into the city. A man is carrying a jar of water. We'll meet you. Follow him to the house and, uh, that uh, he enters. Say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where's the guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He'll show you a large upstairs room. Everything is furnished. Go ahead and make the preparations there. Peter and John were sent out as a team. 
to go make dinner. That was their job that day, to prepare. So they left, they found the things just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. They were his team. The 12 were his team. The 72 were a part of his team. And you and I are a part of his team. It's not something that we can do just by watching. It's not something that we can do by sitting on the edges. It's not something that we can do just by showing up every so often and listening to the sermon and singing worship songs. Being his team means being engaged with him and with one another. Now we're going to get ready to go through a, a new series here entitled Not a Fan. And as we do that, my prayer is that it will not only change us to be more of a team, but that it will, he will use it to reach others to come and be a part of the team as well. That we will use it as an invitable opportunity to bring in people that maybe are sitting kind of on the edge. Maybe they come to church at Christmas and Easter. Maybe they, they come every so often because we really push. Maybe they, uh, uh, they, they come um, you know, only for special events when, when you know, my daughter or son is, is singing up front. Those people are, are, are people that are just ripe to hear this message of not a fan. And we should be inviting them as his team. There are four things that uh, we're offering for you to do to engage and to be involved and to be a part of the team during the not a fan series. And those four things are on this uh, half sheet that you have inside of your program. The first thing is to uh, come to worship services just like you're doing right now. The worship services for Not A Fan will be March 16th, 23rd, and 30th, and then all of the Sundays in April as well. The second thing that you can do, uh, if you're thinking like a team, uh, you could read the playbook, okay? The playbook in this case for Not A Fan is actually you have two options this time. Normally we have a book that you can, you can read, and you, and you can do that. Here's the book for Not A Fan. It's a, a great book. Uh, actually that stands on its own all by itself um, you could actually just read this and it would take you through the material this is not broken up to go along with what we're doing on Sunday in small groups though this is just reading through a book there's about 12 chapters in here so if you break it up over a six to seven week thing you might be reading a chapter or two a week in order to get through the book over the time that we're doing the not a fan series the second option is the Follower's Journal. looks like this. The difference is the Follower's Journal is a little bit smaller and it's got a red stripe on it so you can tell which one. The one with the red stripe, the Follower's Journal, actually has daily devotions in it. So if you're looking for something that goes along with what we talked about on Sunday and then has daily readings for you to do, the Follower's Journal would be the book that you would want. If you're looking to read something kind of book style, the book would be the thing that you would want. Or you can do both. Um, we're trying to get these at, at, a, at a cheaper price. Our suggested donation for these would be $750 for one, uh, $15 for both of them. And it's a little bit better than what you can get on, online um, by us buying some things in bulk. And so you can start thinking about what you would like to do with either one. As we do with any of these series, if you can't afford it, please take the book anyway. We want you to be a follower and not be limited by your finances. Uh, and we'll give you ways to get those. We'll start having those books available to you next week. The third thing is the small groups. Small groups would be like a, a, a team practice. It's where you get together to actually apply what it is that you've learned. It's when you talk at a group that you start to engage all of these concepts and you start realizing, well, I don't really believe this. Well, I do believe this. Well, you know, I want to believe this, but I'm really struggling with this. And talking that out with somebody can be just very helpful in our process of growth. And so that's when the small group comes into play. It's like going to practice before you're actually getting into the game. 
Sundays at 2.30 uh, p.m., Tuesdays at 6.30, starting for food, and then the, the study starts at a half an hour later. Any one of them that says food, uh, it's, food starts at that time, and then a half hour later the study begins. Wednesdays we will do them at 6.45, Thursdays at 6, and then Saturday at 8 a.m. All of those will be doing the Not A Fan study uh, during the seven weeks that are listed above. So find a time slot that works for you. The nice thing about it is if you miss like a small group and I can't make it on, well, I can't make it on Tuesday because something come, came up for this particular Tuesday, you can go to Wednesday or Thursday or Saturday or Sunday and you'll be getting the same material and you'll be able to engage in conversation with people. It's, it'll be the same style. And then the fourth thing is to actually play the game to be involved in a ministry team. For this week, I'd like for you to take what you learned last week and apply it here. Um, circle the things that are you. I'm a sent one, that was the apostle. Truth sayer was prophet. Good news sharer was evangelist. Uh, shepherd is a pastor. I care about caring for people. Explainer is a teacher. Showing God to people. Uh, maybe that would be worship team. You would enjoy doing something like that. Healer, helper, guide, or I just want to be a conduit for God, however that looks. You can circle the ones that apply to you. And next week we'll have specific ministries and schedules for you, and you can look at it and sign up to be a part of the team just for this seven-week time period so that you can be know that God is going to be working in you and through you all the way through the series that you've made yourself available to him they thought they were just making food they were just going to have the Passover meal which is you know a nice event in and of itself that you, you would do but this one was going to be different for when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among you. I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread at another time and said, he gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to them. I have to wonder if any of them were thinking about the five loaves as he broke the bread and gave it to them. I have to wonder if, if the flood of memory of his teachings and his explanations and the things that they went to get through together as his team the times where they argued with one another and he calmed them down and got them pointed toward God again the times where they were sitting in the crowd that very first day and he looked at each one of them and said you 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 you're going to be one of my apostles my close knit team I don't know what went through their minds that day. But my guess is they weren't expecting for him to say, this is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When he took the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which will be poured out or is poured out for you. When they took communion that night for the first time, they knew they were a part of his team. As you take it today, remember that the word communion means community, connected to. And that as you take it, you are connected to every person in this building today and everyone around the world who is taking communion today as his team. 
His body. And as you take it, be ready. Be ready for Him to work through you and in you in amazing ways. Let's take communion today.
course, you know the rest of the story. It was after that night that he went and laid down his life, that he gave his life for us, doing his part of the Father's plan, dying to become what was necessary to pay the penalty that for our sin, which was death. It was only three days later that he rose from the dead in fulfillment of his own prediction, proving that he was not only a prophet, but as he rose from the dead, that he was the Son of God. And when he did that and got ready to leave, he empowered finally his team. He gave them the charge. Guys, I've trained you. I've prepared you. I've gotten you ready for this. You are going to now go and make disciples of all nations. You will teach them to follow me. You will baptize them in my name. And trust, you're not alone. I'll be with you, even to the very end of the age. Then he told them to go and wait until the Holy Spirit would come. And so the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk away from the city. When they arrived, they were upstairs in the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all of his brothers. They were his team. And we are today his team still. As you get ready to leave today, pray for God to bring you back next week. Start working in you and preparing you to be a part of his team. Look over that list and pray over those items. Okay, God, what service am I going to be going to? 9, 30, or 11? Okay, God, which book or books do you want me to be reading so that you can talk to me through this series? Okay, God, what group am I going to be going to so that I can be meeting with people and talking with them and making this real in my life? Okay, God, how are you going to use my gifts as a part of your team? Come next week prepared to sign up. Come next week prepared to dig in, to become a part of his team, and to start inviting one more. Because as his team, we are called to go and make disciples, to empower one more to walk together.